Patterns of the Spread of Epidemics, a Comparative Analysis of the Black Death in 14th Century Europe and the 2014 Ebola Outbreak in West Africa. Urbanization poses a challenge to disease control and prevention. Along with the urban sprawl we've seen globally in the past 60 years, 55% of the world's population now live in urban areas, we've also seen the rapid spread of infectious disease. Epidemiologies have seen little change in the past few centuries, and patterns of human behavior are generally the same. The problem of epidemics comes down to human interaction. In urban areas, people are more susceptible to illness through general overcrowding, trading and traveling ports, pollution, non-human disease vectors such as fleas and bats, and misinformation. This paper dives deep into the past to examine the bubonic plague through a behavioral archaeology lens, then back to the present to examine the most recent Ebola outbreak in 2014 and compares the two. This is to answer, what can past epidemics in urban areas teach us about disease control and prevention in the present? The question my project addresses is what are the top factors that contribute to the spread of disease in urban settings? My stance is that misinformation, social inequality, and exposure are, at the, are the top three factors contributing to the epidemiology of epidemics. As the population of urban areas continues to grow at a rapid rate, so do the risk of epidemics. In the last decade, we saw the Ebola outbreak extinguish large portions of communities. With the loss of so many people comes the collapse of economies, family slash social orders, the human psyche, the list goes on. It's also important to bring these issues to the surface so as to promote social justice, since areas that are hit the hardest are the poor slash unstable ones. To have a platform that people and governments look for advice in times of st stability and spread information is not only misleading but maleficent. In future events like these, we must protect people and eradicate actual pertinent threats. This is a critique of organizations that claim to promote health and prosperity but do not consider scientific fact when making statements that could be a detriment to society instead of being beneficial. This research also aids in the, in the accumulation of knowledge in the medical anthropology field by taking a post-structuralist view on epidemiology, encompassing health disparities based on socioeconomic class and geographical location. Though technologies have changed through history, we are, we are able to glean basic information from the past to avoid repeating the same problems in the future. We are living in a globalized world. Trade and travel have made us more vulnerable to contact disease than ever before. It is projected that 68% of people will be living in urban areas by the year 2050. Capitalists will say that people are our bi biggest asset to keeping economies afloat. But this is an issue that most of us from different sectors can get behind. We're social creatures. To lose half of our population would be devastating in more ways than one. Through this research, I hope to bring a deeper understanding and awareness of the vectors through which diseases are carried so that there is a lesser chance of epidemic turning into a pandemic. I hope to bring awareness to the public about critical media consumption, as well as resources available to learn them. Another aim is to gauge susceptibility for people of different socioeconomic levels. It is my ultimate goal to lessen general suffering. Because public health emergencies like this strike panic in the public, the spread of misinformation can be fatal. Rumors spread about Ebola epidemiology led to the murder of health workers, as well as misunderstandings by the public of what vectors are actually relevant. Consequently, people avoided innocent things, such as bushmeat, whose relevance to the spread of Ebola has come into question, as there is no scientific basis to uphold the claim that it is a vector of Zaire Ebola virus. 
The only animals besides humans found to carry the virus are chimpanzees, gorillas, and deakers. And they didn't practice the things that helped control the spread of disease, like washing hands, covering coughs, and practicing safe sex. Human-to-human -human contact was not emphasized as a serious threat to the spread of disease, undoubtedly proliferating the spread of the virus. Behavioral archaeology is pertinent to this study as the spread of disease has much to do with people's everyday actions. Physical contact with others, the environment, the spread of information slash motivation for the spread, poor treatment technique by health workers as a consequence of receiving misinformation, as well as actions taken by the general public as a result of information. Literature, document, slash data analyses are utilized since I cannot be in the actual field conducting my research. I will also be imploring urban archaeology to assess the environmental conditions, such as housing, population density, access to facilities such as hospitals, medical professionals, and media that contribute to this, this, the spread of disease as I believe it is imperative to look at all studies holistically in order to accurately examine the cause of the problem and consequently come up with the most beneficial solution. Post-structuralism is a theory that critiques ideas of structuralism through looking at material remains. It is a theory that, progress, that is progressive because it identifies the flaws of structures already in place and brings them to the surface in order to right the wrongs and improve on what we've already built. This theory was used by Foucault in his studies of body politic, which addresses how social and political institutions reform social control, perform social control over the bodies of individual, thus maintaining a sense of political power. Poststructuralism is relevant in my studies because I'm examining how organizations such as the United States, States Agency for International Development and the United Nations Children's Fund, <clears throat> uh, with our, which are both funded by the United Nations, as well as the World Health Organization, who is made up of the United Nations as well, and whose main concern is supposed to be international public health. These are the same organizations that spread misleading information about how Ebola is transmitted. I can also use this theory to examine structures in the 14th century era that had to do with proliferation of the plague. The bubonic plague is a lymphatic infection spread primarily through the bite of the rat flea, Xenocilia troparis, infected with the bacterium Yersinia pestis, although it can be spread through the lungs or bloodstream. It was introduced through Europe from Crimea through a trading port in October of 1347. When it reached London during December of the following year, its effects were impossible to ignore. At its peak, Londoners saw up to 200 bodies of people that had, had succumbed to the plague every day. The epidemic eradicated nearly half of Europe's population in the 14th century. Plague patients typically experience high fever, delirium, aching limbs, seizures, and buboes, which are swollen lymph nodes prone to bursting after a few days. These buboes may heal in some, however, in some others, internal bleeding may occur, producing black spots on the extremities, called gangrene, that can lead to fatal ulcers. The Ebola outbreak of 2014 in West Africa has a similar story about catastrophic damage. The Director General of the World Health Organization, WHO, described the outbreak as the most severe acute public health emergency in modern times, representing a crisis for international peace and security. She adds that the outbreak is a threat to the very survival of societies and governments in already very poor countries. Like the plague, Ebola had, found, had a profound impact on families, the economy, and health systems alike. In total, 11,315 confirmed Ebola deaths in two years. Ebola symptoms include nausea, vomiting, bloody diarrhea, 
red eyes, rash, chest pain and cough, sore throat, stomach pain, severe weight loss, bruising, bleeding, usually from the eyes, and when close to death, possible bleeding from the ears, nose and rectum, and internal bleeding. The plague struck during medieval times when the church was the most powerful and rich institution. The plague was initially viewed as punishment from God for committing evil deeds. To avoid contracting the disease, it was encouraged to flog yourself with a whip. Suggested treatments included drinking the pus of lance buboes, bathing in rose water and vinegar, alternatively in the patient's own urine, applying a mixture of tree sap and human excrement to buboes, and other medically questionable methods. Along with prescribing problematic remedies, problematic remedies, plague doctors had uniforms to protect themselves from infection that were flawed due to the lack of knowledge they had on disease prevention, including six-inch beaks full of herbs to override the smell of rotting humans, goggles, top hat, and fully covered, except for the ankles. The costume would have been perfect except for the fleas bit the ankles of the doctors and the beak had two nostrils through which bodily fluids could enter. Some unqualified plague doctors were told to have given shoddy remedies and then robbed their patients. Multi-story timber framed buildings appeared in the streets of London in order to cope with the need for space, which also led to overcrowding and increased demand on London's infrastructures, such as water supply and the disposal of sewage, all of which are likely to have facilitated the spread of the infectious disease. My research concluded that structures set in place in 14th century Europe were a huge contributing factor to both the introduction of the plague as well as the proliferation of it. The structure that prompted the initial transfer of the disease was economy through a trading port in Sicily. Rats infected, the plague, rats infected with the plague deboarded the ship from Crimea along with other trade goods and made their way across Europe. Another structure that influenced the degree of the plague was the health sector. Unsafe treatments and burials of infected bodies helped the virus to run rampant. The church also played a role in that it denied scientific facts and placed the power of and will of the virus on God. Socioeconomic status also had an effect on epidemiology since those who were wealthy enough to have space were less likely to contract the disease. Misinformation proved to be the number one driving force behind the unnecessary spread of the plague. However, this was mostly due to the lack of medical knowledge that people of the time had. The lack of general medical knowledge can partially be attributed to the church whose influence in suppressing science was major. Though human behavior has relatively stayed the same, technology has advanced tremendously, which influences the theoretical application of the information. We can never be 100% accurate in taking past behavior and applying it to the present, since, especially in this day and age, information and technology are constantly evolving. There are still many other ancient epidemics to be explored in different locations in different cultures so as to avoid ethnocentrism. Also, in my personal opinion, in order to prevent epidemics slash pandemics, we need to have informed media, equal housing, and healthcare, and to shop local.